There's no truth that gay men like rearranging furniture. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mike and Craig, for inviting me along today. Um, the project I'd like to talk about is one that uh, took place at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in 2010 uh, to 2011. Um, I, was, I was asked by Shout Festival, Dave Viney, who, who ran it at the time, um, whether I would be interested in, in, in working in Birmingham. And I said I'd be very interested in working with the museum at Birmingham and with uh, Andy Horn, the curator there in particular. And what I'd like to try and do is um, explain to you what I was trying to achieve with the exhibition. And I think in order to do that, it would, it would make sense to start off with an explanation of what, what, I'm, uh, what I'm communicating with the word queer. So I'm, I'm using it in two separate, but possibly linked ways. Uh, in one way, it's, it's about an identity group looking at lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And on the other hand, it's about looking at the difference, uh, difference and hegemonic power. And the Birmingham Project, for me, tried to link these two identity difference and undermining power structures within cultural organizations. And so when I, when I got the opportunity to work with Birmingham, I was interested in interrogating their collections to see what they had that I could work with as a curator. And I, I, um, I went into their object database and I searched for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, nothing came up. And then finally under queer, one object came up. So that was good, we got one object. Um, unfortunately, it was a Victorian photograph of a girl who had a queer kind of elfin beauty. So um, that kind of, that didn't help me too much, but it gave me somewhere to start at least. Um, and I decided that actually if I couldn't work with the collection, then let's work against it. Let's look at what the museum had and let's look at how I would see it as a queer man and see how labeling might change, how we might uh, deal with objects differently. So in the project as a whole, we ended up with 19 interventions, 14 placed within um, existing display cases. Uh, we had five cases brought out with objects coming from the store. So rather than trying to put a queer exhibition on, I wanted to queer the museum. I wanted to see what the museum was like through a queer viewpoint, and also what would happen when we destabilized the heteronormativity of the museum. Um, this is a, a map of the exhibition, so anywhere that's green had been queered. So you can see that actually it was right throughout the museum. And um, I've got to say, Birmingham took risks that no other museum was really doing at the time, and, and hats off to them. And I used a number of techniques as, as a curator slash artist. Um, just to run through them very briefly, queer is a verb, to queer, I have queered something, I have destabilized something. Heterosexual couplings, every time there was a straight couple, let's put a queer couple in. Every time a curator had put a man and a woman, two separate sculptures together, let's take one of them out and replace it so that we had queer couples. Often they're very arbitrary decisions that curators make, but let's, let's try questioning them a bit. And I'll give you some examples of dealing with historical queer narratives, questioning some of the collecting policies that are going on in museums, and then some of the more fun things of slang, popular culture, and political messages that are sometimes uh, utilized and sometimes ignored. But overall, as an exhibition strategy, I wanted to work with the things that I love about queer culture, uh, with visual jokes, camp, double entendre, um, and a little bit of subterfuge, things that have been coming through today um, in other people's talks. So to start off with queer as a verb, to queer, to make strange, to make gay, to make lesbian, um, the sculpture in the center of this picture is a bronze by uh, Jacob Epstein. And it's, I, I've, I walked past it many, many times as a student. And it was just a large bronze sculpture of a person with wings. It's titled Lucifer. Um, when I started working with the museum, Victoria, the keeper of fine arts, said, are you going to work with Lucifer? And I was kind of like, um, obviously, slightly second guessing. Yeah, of course I am. Of course I am. Why? 
Um, and she said, well, uh, Epstein sculpted it with the body of a man and the face of a woman. So already this is a, a kind of a trans object. It's, it's an object that, that moves between genders. And I th what I found interesting was, as a gay man who wanted to read gay readings into objects, I never saw this. And that, homo that kind of heteronormative reading is so embedded in museum culture that unless we make it obvious, nobody sees it. Um, so how to make it obvious? Um, I ended up draping it with a, a cape made of just over 2,000 artificial green carnations. Uh, the green carnation was used by Victorian uh, men as a way of signifying queerness and um, bluntly to pick each other up. Um, and I thought, actually, let's just signify that this object has intrinsic queerness. I'm not making it queer, it's already queer. I'm just, I'm just signposting this for visitors. And we use this idea of a green carnation on every label of every intervention within the show, so that if people wanted to, they could cruise to the galleries, they could pick up objects, they could pick up queerness. They could always, you know, they could ignore it as well. And that's kind of how, for me, queerness often works. It's there if you want it. If you want to walk past it, you can indeed. As I said, queering heterosexual coupling, as soon as you start looking for the couples in museums, they're everywhere. Um, so the figurines on the left are in the collection, the figurine on the right is a new one. That, I mean, one thing, um, it's often said that there are very few queer or intrinsically queer objects, and to some extent that's true, but being an artist is quite handy because if they're not there, you just make them. And that's really, really quite useful. Um, and here, the sculpture, the sculpture on the left was replaced. It was uh, Eve with Cupid, and I replaced it with Ulysses bending the bow. So that this mirroring of two male figures happened rather than the more normal male and female figures. In queer history, most historical narratives are quite bleak. Um, the state usually, traditionally recorded same-sex activity through uh, arrest, imprisonment, and a criminal record. Uh, when you do get a less negative historical narrative, it feels very important to keep hold of it. Uh, this piece, this small figurine, is about the ladies of Langochlin, who were uh, two Irish women who uh, lived in Inishtig in the south of Ireland. And in the 1700s, they were being pushed into unwanted marriages and left Ireland and moved to North Wales and set up home together. Um, they were visited by Byron. They kind of became the celebrity lesbian couple of the 1700s. Um, and there's just something really nice about making a small commemorative piece that went in with um, contemporaneous other ceramics from the 1700s and just uh, allowed a space for this non-normative relationship to take place within the museum. Birmingham Museum Ceramics also has a huge collection of uh, tiles. Uh, and um, I was kind of keen to work with them. They're ceramic tiles that have been um, tin glazed, and then they have uh, images on top. One set of tiles was called Low Lives and Satirical Subjects, and I thought, if I'm going to be anywhere, that's where I want to be. <laughs> uh, this piece is called uh, Jake's Progress, and obviously is a very cheap pun on Hogarth's Rake's Progress and follows the diversionary activities of Jake through coming out, um, getting the obligatory tattoo, uh, finding men on Grinder, not something that happened with Hogarth quite so much. Um, ended up in three sums in the bushes, a bit of drug activity, and ended up with semen true love at the end. I couldn't be quite as bleak as Hogarth, but I am working on it. And then questioning collecting Policies. Gallery 33 in Birmingham was set up, uh, I think, in the early 90s um, and was a gallery that was specifically curated about difference. And it's very, it, it looks at ethnographic, racial, cultural difference, gender difference, age difference. Uh, it does not explore sexuality, sorry queer sexuality in any way at all. And I was interested that for a gallery that dealt with difference, why there was one difference that wasn't allowed to be seen. Um, 2010 was just after uh, civil partnerships had come in. And uh, I just went out and bought a civil partnership card and placed it in one of the cases that 
was about uh, celebrations. And civil partnerships have suddenly given us a wealth of material culture that relates to positive identification of same-sex relationships in a way that wasn't available 10 years ago. Um, and I think the point is quite simple, that actually the objects are there, it's whether museums want to think about difference and include them within the display. Um, as part of the project, I was allowed access to their museum stores, which I, I still can't believe they, they let me loose in there. Um, and usually, museum departments separate objects, usually by material. So, um, woods kept separate from metal and textiles would be somewhere else from uh, anthropology or um, from the taxidermy sections. And I was allowed to run riot and just see what connections I made as I looked through the store. Um, I was particularly drawn to the salt glazed bears and for um, anybody who hasn't been down to her street in a while, a bear is a large hairy gay man. Um, so I was quite excited to see these representations of large hairy gay men in the ceramics department and imagine my excitement when I found an otter, a thin hairy gay man in the taxidermy department. And putting these four objects together, suddenly started this dialogue going that actually these objects talk about queer, queer cultural, uh, queer contemporary cultural identity. They were not bought to do that, they were not made to do that, but they do do that, and they did for the period of the exhibition. Um, and it's just remembering that objects can tell many stories to different people and the reasons they were collected or made are not necessarily the reasons we want to use them at present. And again, in the stores, I was given the opportunity to take uh, these, the figures at the bottom are large uh, colored wooden figures from fairground rides. And I was interested in the idea of um, Polari, which was a coded language used by gay men in mainly the 40s, 50s, and 60s in England. And it was a way of uh, talking about really quite filthy things to each other and avoiding detection by uh, anybody in authority. Um, Polari is a language that came about from partly fairground talk, partly uh, uh, Romany cant, uh, partly language used by prostitutes, and it all came together in this coded language that possibly most famous for Sandy and Julian on Radio 4, Around the Horn. Um, the figures on uh, the top um, use words from Polari and are, are, are used to create figurines to describe them on the left. It's a figurine called Happy Hips, which is a man who minces, uh, um, uh, wanders around in a slightly, you know what I mean. And in the middle <laughs> is, um, I'm not going to do no. that. I'm, I'm, no. no, I'm not going to do it. No. That's, that's just degrading. Um, in the middle is Picking Up the Batter, which is um, picking up a, a rent boy. And on the right is the one that I can't believe they let me do, which is Boner Arm, which is Polari for having a really nice cock. Um, I was conscious that, you know, in 2010, 11, in Birmingham, life is quite liberal for most people. Um, and I didn't want this just to be a display of, God, how great we are, how liberal we all are. Um, and uh, this, this last, I think, uh, this last piece I want to talk about was um, looking at uh, the work of James Baturu, the Ugandan Minister for Ethics and Integrity, who in 2009 uh, called for the death penalty to be introduced for gay men in Uganda. Um, and he was said that he was famous for saying that not even animals do that. And I was interested in juxtaposing these contemporary figurines of half men, half animals, with uh, 1700s figures of sphinxes. And I think it's, it's kind of important to remember that in 80 member states of the United Nations, conceptual same-sex activity is criminal. And in six members of the United Nations, it's still punishable by death. So while this is, um, well, it's fun and it's humorous, and it's great fun to do this sort of work. Um, life isn't easy in, in lots of the world. So kind of just to wrap up, um, the lessons I learned, and my background was as a curator, and so coming in as an artist to work with collections was a very different um, 
experience and a, and a really fun one. But the objects contain many stories and histories and curators actively decide what is talked about and what is discussed within museum displays. Um, museums are not neutral. Museums do not tell the whole truth. Museums tell partial truths and those truths are decided by somebody. Um, the freedom that as an artist I enjoyed is not a freedom that I felt I could have when I was a curator. And I think that's a real shame that there are many, many creative curators out there working in museums who maybe feel constrained by ideas of documented truth, of being able to back stuff up. And with marginalized histories, quite often that truth isn't available in the same way as it is for the histories of people who were in positions of power. And that continually discriminates, discriminates against um, marginalized people. There's a need to adapt collecting patterns and cataloging terms. Uh, I find it hard to believe that there is only one piece of work in Birmingham Museum's collection with a queer relevance. And until we start recognizing this and documenting it, recording it, and remembering it, every time an artist like me comes along, we have to start again. And that takes up a lot of time. And it's a shame that information gets lost. And finally, if, if groups without large, unique bodies of material culture, of stuff, of things that represent them visibly, are to have any place in museums, we need to consider how we talk about objects and how we use objects. Um, the final slide is, is Donkey Boy, which at the end of the exhibition was acquired by Birmingham into their collections. And um, Donkey Boy doesn't fit in with the donkeys, and he doesn't really fit in with the boys either. And he's just there as a little reminder that we, are, we all end up in situations where we don't quite feel we belong. And uh, wouldn't it be great if uh, we could all be donkey boys in a donkey boy land together? Thank you. Mm -hmm.